Why Frank Mueller? Why are there not more of these or similar models, is what I thought. I bet you would have not associated this watch with Frank Mueller at first glance. It almost looks too mundane compared to the other brain children of the Master of Complications. Let's have a closer look. Frank Miller is a rather young watch brand, since its current form existed only since 1991, which would make it a neo-vintage brand, so to speak. Before, from the early 80s onwards, Mr. Müller already restored timepieces, for example, for the Patek Philippe Museum, and also released his own watches. All of them with complicated movements built completely by himself. But teaming up with the former jeweler and businessman Vartan Sermakis, who supplied exalted clients like Daniel Roth before, led to the ultimate rise of the brand Frank Müller up to this point. They established their current manufacturer in Jean Tau, Switzerland in 1994, in a historic and impressive estate, later known as Watchland. His nickname or marketing slogan, Master of Complications, arose quickly, even though I don't know who gave him that name or if they branded it themselves. But it is well founded on a string of yearly world premieres of very complicated watches. Emerging in that whole era, when Quartz was in full swing and many independent watch companies conglomerated into few industry giants was a feat in itself, Frank Müller chose to do things differently, in every aspect of mechanical watchmaking. Hence, you also know the name for its illustrious case and dial designs. The company was deemed troubled in the early 2000s, but aside some drama surrounding the duo of Sir Marcus and Müller and alleged bankruptcy or unfounded rumors about them bringing in Russian parts and labeling them at Swiss at the time, the company is still doing well today. Even though Frank Müller himself left the premises of Watchland and the brand altogether after a particular falling out with his partner in 2003. All very mysterious and not well documented, I might add. Anyways, Sermakis was quick to announce that business was going to continue, currently under the CEO Nicolas Rudash, who joined the brand in 2007. They are releasing watches today, quite successfully, and over the years have outfitted many celebrities, for whatever that's worth. Anyway, this aspect and their tonneau-shaped and curved cases often brought them to close comparison with Richard Mille. But to put it into the correct timeline, Müller owns the title of having it done first, since they were already known for this distinct design in the 90s, when Richard Mille didn't exist yet. But then again, I think in that specific high-end niche of watches, they can happily coexist. For this watch right here, we go back to the 90s and talk more about motorsports involvement of Frank Müller, which was more substantial than I was aware, and even less documented online. It immediately starts with the Royal League of Motorsports, as we call it in Germany, the Formula One. To reveal the background of this chronograph, we need to make a small detour to 1994 and the last race of the season in Adelaide, Australia, which was dominated by the battle of no other than Damon Hill and Michael Schumacher. But at the other side of the rankings, the Larousse team switched out one of their drivers for Jean-Denis Deletra, a so-called pay driver who brings his own budget and sponsors into the team. With this switch, Frank Müller came onto a Formula One vehicle as a sponsor for the first time, even when Delatra went to drive two more races for another team, Pacific, in 1995 in Portugal and Germany, Frank Müller made it onto that car as well of course, but without any success in the rankings at all. Well, can't blame Frank Müller there. But with the departure from Formula One, this driver took his ambition into the Le Mans and Sebring series and the Frank Müller lettering followed onto a McLaren F1 GTR and a Ferrari F550 Maranello in the second half of the 90s. During that time, an eerily similar watch saw the light of day, which probably already set the foundation for the watch of this video, in a less limited, less visually intense fashion and with a hand-wound Le Mania 1877 inside, namely the Endurance 24 from 1997. But I'll get to this watch now, I promise. So, in 1998, Frank Müller partnered not only with one driver, but became one of the sponsors of the complete Italian team Minardi, a fan-favorite underdog in the Formula One series that was famous for making the most of their smaller budgets. Founded by Giancarlo Minardi, they were part and parcel of the F1 circus from 85 to 2005. That's exactly the partnership that was celebrated with this watch, as the case back will reveal later on. The 1998 race car featured a small Frank Müller signage close to the driver as well. 
Interestingly, upon inquiring about this piece via Frank Mueller's customer service directly, it was revealed that information is scarce, since this limited series of 50 watches was commissioned by an Italian importer, which could already explain why it does not fit the over-the-top complicated watch image of the rest of the brand's lineup. Every watch manufacturer seems to have their intriguing outlier models, and I'm happy to find exactly those. I'd enjoy if you can add to that list of motorsport tie-ins from Frank Mueller in the comments, by the way. Unsurprisingly, and from first glance, this watch is geared towards racing and exudes this in every aspect. The stainless steel case, for example, features a classic racing Krona aesthetic. 40mm in diameter without the crown, 49mm from luck to luck. With the slightly domed sapphire crystal, the thickness adds up to 15mm, so not the slimmest of watches. But the black tachymeter bezel and curved lugs makes it seem comparably sleek and pleasing on the wrist. The screw-down pushers will probably bring up an association to another very famous model in the racing chronograph world. As with the earliest models of said famous cousin, this one has no crown guard. No info about water resistance, but I wouldn't dare to bring this near water. Probably 5 atmospheres at maximum. The bracelet fits visually, the classical 3-link design. But it is not original, as the rather simple buckle also testifies. I think I should recommend a change to my friend and lender, as it does not do it justice at all in terms of quality. The original armband was a black leather strap with a signed buckle. Probably looked something akin to this. Under the sapphire, a bustling red, black and silvery dial awaits, with three subdials in the typical layout of a Valju 7750. The hour indices are bold and loomed, while the hands combine different styles, lozenge or diamond minute and hour hands, a broad arrow for the central chronoseconds and modern tapered ones for the subdials. A weird and wonderful mix of blued hands. The dial is also sporting a finish line, above what seems to be the day and date apertures. But don't be fooled. It's obvious with the weekdays being exchanged for a total of 14 race tracks to choose from. Peculiarly, two are missing from the 1998 F1 season. I can only speculate why there are only 14, since even customer service does not know a whole lot about this model. Maybe it was because of the space on the day wheel for 14 versus 16 track names, or the general popularity of these tracks. But what looks to be an ordinary date here is actually a GMT or rather dual time function. You can set this 24 hour disc on the crown like a date, but it will jump onwards every hour, providing you with an easy to use second time zone. Seems simple, yet I've never encountered it like this before. On the backside, the case back is adorned with the logo of T Minardi and a few engravings, but under the hood lies the FM7000 caliber. And as you might have guessed from the dial layout, it is indeed based on the Valju 7750. Which might surprise some, but then again, FM did not shy away from using an already sophisticated base to achieve their ultimate design here. And as mentioned, this movement was given its own twist with different functionalities. It also bears a full platinum rotor. The finissage includes Côte de Genève, blued screws and rotinated parts. A beautiful rendition of what can be achieved with a great base caliber. Then again, I know some already frown upon the thought of an ETA Valju movement in a what is an about 6000 plus euro watch, but admittedly a lot was done to enhance this base caliber to also include the promise of chronometer quality and accuracy, for example. This watch does not really fit the typical Frank Müller lineup, which is understandable when considering it was commissioned from an Italian importer to cater to that specific racing team, but it incorporated some beautiful quirks and a finish that is still very much worthy of the brand, and makes me ask, why? Why is there not more of this in Frank Miller's history? What's your opinion about it? Thanks to each and everyone who ventures with me into the weird and wonderful of the watch world. See you in the next one on the Time Warn channel.